You're listening to After Images, a podcast for cinephiles that takes a deep dive into moving images. Each episode features a special guest who is invited to explore a film of their choice. After Images is hosted by film writers Franck Bouleg and Marisa C. Hayes. On today's episode, we welcome filmmaker, producer, and writer Naila Inukshuk, who shares her appreciation for Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 horror film Psycho. Often considered the first slasher, Psycho tells the story of Marion Crane, played by Janet Lee, that's Scream Queen Jamie Lee Curtis's mother. Having stolen money to join her lover, Marion is on the run and stops off at an isolated hotel run by Norman Bates. Played by Anthony Perkins, Bates appears to live under the influence of his overbearing mother. At this point, the film shifts from thriller to horror and takes the audience on a wild ride. Interwoven with our discussion of Psycho, we are privileged to hear Naila Inukshuk discuss the making of her first feature-length film, Slashback. It's a genre-defying flick that merges elements of sci-fi, horror, comedy, friendship, indigenous storytelling, and resilience within an Inuit community that premiered in 2022. Naila Inukshuk is a filmmaker, producer, and comic book writer based out of Toronto, Canada. Naila co-created the teenage superhero Snow Guard, a member of Marvel's Champions League, with her friend James Zog. Inukshuk's first feature, Slashback, is a sci-fi adventure about a group of 14-year-old girls from a remote Arctic community who take on an alien invasion. The film premiered at SXSW in March 22. Trapped, a short horror film shot specifically for 24K resolution, 7 foot high, 270 degree screen, premiered at the 2022 Venice Biennale. Inukshuk is currently developing a second feature with her writing partner, Ryan Cavan, set to film in 2024. We're so pleased today to welcome Naila Inukshuk. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you guys. And for today's discussion, you proposed um, mostly to go into Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho and a few other titles that you appreciate. So we always like to start off with the question, what does Psycho mean to you? Why did you choose Psycho today? Yeah, I think that for me, it was just such a foundational movie for me when I was really, when I was kind of starting to under see movies as something more than just this, something that was this fun, entertaining thing to, to watch. And I was at that time really starting to, to think about movies uh more seriously and thinking about making my own and I was making some you know videos with my friends and my cousins and that sort of thing and I always loved horror and Hitchcock and I think that there was just something very thrilling about watching something that felt like you were kind of getting away with something uh and I remember even with um with Hitchcock in particular, one of my very first experiences watching a scary movie was with the birds. And I remember I had a girlfriend over for a sleepover and we were eight years old. And this is the movie that my mom suggested we watch, <laughs> which I think is, speaking of psycho, I mean, that's kind of crazy <laughs> because we were the exact same age as those kids who it, the, the, I would say the most experienced a terrifying scene is when they're having to rush those kids out of school and they're all being attacked. And uh, so that movie was was really scary, but it just was also so exciting to be to be watching something like this. And then so then later, when I was uh, probably maybe 13, 12 or 13, I was having another slumber party with a group of girlfriends. And so I brought over Psycho, but I hadn't watched it before, but I was just thinking that this would be fun and scary. And I had heard that it was really scary. And we started watching it and all of my girlfriends were just like, this is so boring. And <laughs> because for the first 
you know, 10 minutes, it's mostly uh, her in her office and she's deciding what to do and, and then driving for a long time. Uh, so it's, it, we, we turned it off before anything had really happened. And so then I went home and I watched it on my own. And the, I remember I just like left my bedroom where I would watch my, watch movies. And I came downstairs to my mom and I was just like, this is a perfect movie. Like it should, this could be released today and it would just be terrifying. It would be perfect. And then I found out that Gus Van Sant had actually just remade the movie shot for shot. And uh, so it was, um, yeah, I, I mean, I loved it from the first time I uh, watched it fully on my own and and have uh, and the performance of Norman Bates in particular, I, I thought was so fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I really it, I, and and so for me, it was one of these movies that um, just as I was thinking about it seems crazy that as a teenager you're having to figure out what you want to be doing with the rest of your life but you do feel that pressure and I was um trying to decide if I wanted to go and and study film at university which seemed a little bit silly uh or if I should be doing something more practical uh and or more I don't know something that could benefit my community in some way you know and so it, it was uh it, it was just for me uh in a, a time where I was really just starting to kind of think about movies as as something that I was really passionate about mm. would you say that it's the um... The, the 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 acting that struck you is it the story the the filmmaking what is it that really touched you that first time that you saw it or is it the 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 revelation of uh, what is at the core of the mystery itself yeah i mean i think all of those things it's there's this mystery trying to figure it out with the sister and and uh and uncover what's happened to her sister and and then, uh, and then this amazingly charming performance by Anthony Perkins. And uh, I mean, I had such a crush on Norman Bates when I was a teenager, <laughs> who is, of course, the psycho in Psycho. <laughs> and um, and so it was, uh, you know, it was really kind of only now I've, I'm, I feel like I'm. I've unpacked some of the reasons why, and I now see these see these behaviors as as problematic, of course. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I I think that the that kind of twist at the end was was so amazing, and then to kind of have this reveal of him at the end in his kind of true form was was so great. But he's he is sweet. Uh, he's, he's portrayed as yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> it's not surprising that uh, you would have uh, found him uh, attractive because he's very uh, pleasurable for most of the film, anyway. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and and but then also in his, he's very um, like this bumbling and and uh, shy person who is uh you know and then obviously dealing with um with an abusive mother and and that so he's clearly vulnerable um i think also for for women can be this thing that we're drawn to and wanting to take care of and it's interesting because i do think that there's kind of a fine line between the humor and the horror in the film and maybe also the charm that we experience and I'm thinking a lot about how Jordan Peele has talked about that kind of porosity between humor and good naturedness and, and horror. And I'm wondering how you feel about that, because I found that also in, in your work as well. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I mean, I think that the kind of the similarities between horror and and comedy and not just um, the situations that can kind of cause you to feel 
both, but then also just how it can be approached within film and creating tension. The uh, and sometimes you know you're you're laughing because something is so horrifying or you just don't want this thing to happen. And and of course, like I mean the the scene in Psycho with the car going down and then just stopping, and it's like, oh, is this not going to work? And then it just continues going. I think is such a a uh, fantastic little moment of comedy within this, the really the darkest, the darkest moment in the movie. Those elements just, I think, go really well together and uh, including, you know, with the, the bit of the absurd. Uh, are there other are moments of the film that you particularly like uh, because of the way they are shot? I mean, are there sequences that stayed with you? Um, I mean, um, people usually uh, think of the shower scene, but are there other possibly um, um, sequences that um, you particularly appreciate? I mean, of course, the shower scene is is fantastic and great. And, um, uh, you know, after I've made Slashback, where we were kind of, um, it, well, it was a bit chaotic. It was an indie movie made with teenagers in this very remote community. And there, and, and it was my first time doing that. So that I was kind of learning all these lessons every day. Uh, every day I felt like I was learning a million lessons and then just being like, oh my gosh, I guess we just do this again and again and again and again. And the, uh, then it was kind of, I, I remember just thinking of, um, of, Hitchcock and how and just the the this um and his shooting of almost exclusively on sets mm -hmm. and this and I just was like oh yeah okay well like I can see now why why something like just this idea of um being able to have have control and I think that there is so much, um, so much control within his work and the framing and consideration of colors and that it's to me very inspiring to kind of consider the, the work and, and preparation. But then, it, you know, it also it, it kind of within these ideas of control. And I, I think a lot just but the cool thing about being able to to make movies and make horror and and write and horror is that you kind of get to process feelings about fear and anxiety and in a way that's kind of creative and and with my co-writer I we've actually started to kind of question how healthy that is for us actually and whether we should be maybe thinking about things that are not just, you know, tension and fear and that sort of, you know, I do think that for me with both Slashback and this next, the, this next project that we're doing, um, it, is, it has really been a, a helpful way to kind of process these feelings of, of anxiety and then control. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is really interesting also with directors and and obviously with Hitchcock and you kind of look throughout his movies uh that he's obviously someone that and and direct I think directors we we like a certain amount of control and and the um and that he is processing certain things and themes throughout throughout his work mm -hmm. and it, with the birds or or psycho it's I feel like there's these men with with mothers who are over a little bit well, not a little bit extremely overbearing and questioning of the women that are coming into the men's lives and and uh have such influence over the men and in, in their lives uh so i feel like that is just an, something that i have definitely related to in in my work and then I think that also then translates to themes it and and also to the cinematography um and and playing with it with control and letting go of control and and within the frame and consideration of, of those things I'm really glad that you mentioned thinking about Hitchcock while filming Slashback because that means we can get right to it. There are a couple of things oh. I 
wanted to ask you about because when we think about Psycho and Hitchcock in general, we've got these wonderful title credits that were done by Saul uh, Bass. And I think that your opening title credits are just so gorgeous and creative. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that and if by any chance um, Saul Bass's work was an inspiration for that too, the way that you integrated the design and the opening title sequence of the film. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that was really kind of fun to play around with. Um, and that's the coolest thing about making movies, I think, is it's a real team sport. You're collaborating with these amazingly talented and creative artists who are really expert at what they do. Mm-hmm. And so at every stage, you're getting to work with, um, you know, whether it's your production designer, or your cinematographer, uh, or the person that you're designing the credits with. It's really exciting to have these conversations and and figure out what works best. And so we had this um, this idea to pl- play around with syllabics, which is the Inuktitut, uh, which is the language that we speak up in Nunavut, where I'm from. And it's the the writing of the of Inuktitut is is often done in syllabics. And so we had the syllabics translated first, and then it kind of does this kind of matrixy switch over to um to the English, the English titles. Actually, there's it kind of play, there's there's it plays with it. I think there's a couple versions. There's I think there's one at one point the titles are it's kind of slashes through, and then at another point it does a kind of matrixy thing. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fun to play. Uh, I, for me, it was very important to, to consider, uh, the fact that this community that we were shooting in and the communities up in the Arctic, that they've never had a, a movie like this made in, made there. And, and my nephews are from the community of, of Pang. And at the time they were, I think four and six years old. And so I was, I just thought that it would be really cool for them to have a movie that uh, this kind of alien invasion Goonies style movie set in their hometown and in that community where their mom is from they speak Inuktitut and and they don't speak English often and my sister my sister Julia she didn't learn how to speak English until she was 13 or 14 so it um was just you know important for us to consider the the community that and that this movie was really kind of made for them and so they see the Inuktitut first and then we also kind of played around with this idea of of subtitles and whether or not to use them we ended up putting in subtitles just to to be fair to all audiences but we also kind of um scripted it in a way that if if audiences were to watch without the subtitles that they would have a, a enough sense of what was going on and and but then there would be just be this version where um Inuit audiences would just have this different kind of layer of understanding fantastic to come back to this comparison with Psycho. Um, I also really love the use of sound in your film. And Psycho, of course, is really celebrated for Bernard Herrmann's w- wonderful composition that really yeah. the rhythm of the film throughout and provides so much tension. And there's this wonderful percussive quality to the sound design in your film as well. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about what you think of the music in Psycho or also how you approach music in, in film? Yeah, well, I mean, the music in Psycho is just so fantastic. We see both the, 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 that title sequence and the music we see referenced in so much. I think that for me, the the approach to the music was, uh, I knew that it was going to be just a really important, well, for, for horror, I think the music is just such an important part to consider. And then this was also a kid's adventure movie but, you know lots of lots of genres mixed in but but kind of the approach to music was going to be really important and the cool thing about the arctic and and our music is that we've got a lot of uh throat singing which is two, two women 
usually it's two women performing at the same time. Someone like Tanya Tagak, who is a, an amazing Inuit throat singer who she performs all over the world. And she has done something very different in that she performs on her own and, and kind of has incorporates all styles of music within her work. But we really want, we worked with Tanya actually to get a bunch of her vocalizations to uh, then play around with, incorporate into the creature's sounds. Um, but whenever there was, uh, whenever there was a alien or something nearby, then we also had Tanya's vocals somewhere within the music. And then the other instrument that is really common within the Arctic is the drum. And so that was really kind of fun to play around with the drum. And that was all uh, done with, well, all done. We also had other percussive instruments, um, but most of the drumming that you hear was done with a uh, traditional drum, uh, different sizes of traditional drum. And we had the amazing musicians, composers, and DJs hallucination um, compose a lot of the score. We kind of placed that throughout. And then we, we started working with another composer to, and, uh, and some musicians to expand the, expand the music. And it was such a, a, a neat process to see that come together. And I mean, we were also doing this over Zoom because of the pandemic happening <laughs> right in the middle of our post-production. So uh, we had to be um, having lots of Zoom sessions and then just kind of sharing things there, sharing things digitally and then kind of coming together to listen and and, and uh, give notes and, and that sort of thing. Incredible. And can you tell us a little bit about how you work with different rhythms? Because in horror, you know, oftentimes there's a kind of acceleration for creating tension. And is that something that was done live organically during recording? Or did you also enjoy like doing sound mixing in post-production to match certain moments? Or how did that work? Yeah, it was almost exclusively done with drums that then we then we had the uh, composers work with and and manipulate and the and that was done to the edit. So certainly there were scenes that that benefited from added tension and 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 heightened uh, just the the heightened emotions around whether it's the there's a certain alien attacks or emotional moments between characters it's you know you're wanting to to try and bring that out with music and and or with silence in some moments and there were times where uh the composers and I would would stop and and look at a scene and it seemed like this would be this maybe this is this big explosive swell in the music, but then it's also like, what if we were to go to our sound designer and instead ask for a swell in the sound design and the natural sounds of the environment? So that playing with that with uh, between um, between all of the all of the different creative people involved was was this ongoing conversation. And my favorite part of the process was I mean it was it always feels too short and we you know these these things are um with low budget filmmaking it's like you have a certain amount of days but this the time spent in sound design was so much fun because then at that point the the edits locked and the color's been done and so the and so you're really starting to see the pieces all come together and and this, the edges kind of get smoothed out with the sound design. So for for me, that that part of the of the process and and playing with the mix and and bringing in elements and taking some out is is such a, a fun part of the process. And then the, and we're also bringing in, of course, when it comes to horror, sometimes it's monster sounds and and all of that. And so it's it's really fun to to play around with like how much blood splatter you want it to sound like. <laughs> Uh, am, I, am I right in thinking that uh, 
besides the influence of Hitchcock, perhaps John Carpenter might have been an influence on the film? Oh yeah, for sure. The thing definitely in, influenced the movie. Uh, and we, the, the girls had never watched it before. And then the night before we started filming, the crew and the cast, this is kind of crazy. There, what, there's, this town is so small that there's not, there wasn't enough housing or any, anywhere for us to stay. So for us to actually make the movie and live in the community for a couple of months, we had to ask the principals at the high school in the grade school to let us live there. And so everyone lived in, they, we turned, we sh shipped up 55 beds and mattresses and turned all of the classrooms into bedrooms. And so everybody had a roommate, which is insane to me. And they uh, had two beds per classroom and we had all of our meals in the gym, the high school gym. And so the night before we started filming, the uh, the girls and I all stayed in one, we put beds together and stayed in one room in the school and we watched the thing uh, and ate, <laughs> it was a mistake. We ate way too much candy and then felt terrible the next day. But uh, that was another lesson we learned is, is candy with kids. Uh, you just have to just not have it around or they'll find, they find ways to sneak it on. But mm -hmm. it, it affects, it definitely affects your ability to work. <laughs> <laughs> but uh just certainly the, john carpenter and then in the in the score as well we were we were thinking of john carpenter for sure and now that you've made your first feature length film when you go back and watch some of these iconic films of the past do you feel like you hear and see them differently yeah i mean honestly watching movies now even even when people talk about I hear people talk about a movie and they just don't like it. And it could be anything like it could be a terrible movie, but I just am like, you guys don't know how hard this is. <laughs> um, but it's uh, I, when I watch, when I go back and watch and um, I'm hopefully shooting another movie this fall, it's really uh, taking the lessons that I, that I learned from my experience and trying to apply that to this next movie and, and just prepare myself in a way that I just wasn't able to before just because I, I didn't fully understand the job. Certainly I'm watching lots of movies and, and considering processes, not just in, in framing and sound design, but then also work how, how you work with actors. And I think it's, uh, I, I find that I, I watch movies in a very different way. Um, earlier in the discussion, you were mentioning um, the uh, level of control that Hitchcock had over his films. And uh, he was famous for storyboarding everything beforehand, for having everything ready in his head before he started shooting. Is this also yeah. yours or are you more, um, are, 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 is there more improvisation when you are on set? Yeah, I think that, for me with Slashback, just because of budget restraints and timing of budget, and then also when we had to film, our final casting happened very soon before we started filming. And so having enough time for rehearsals and blocking within, within the location, these are things that hopefully I'm not terrifying my new producers too much, but it's really important for me to be having uh, as much of an understanding of what's happening beforehand, just because it's such, it is emotional work on uh, when you're doing, when you're doing it on the day and the, and there's so many people involved and the, the camera team will really appreciate it if they know exactly what they're doing that day and the sound people will really appreciate it if they if you know you've talked it through and it's very clear what it is we're trying to capture um and as a director your job is to really take what you can see and hear and make people feel something and so it is kind of our job in advance to kind of be doing that work to figure out okay how can I make people feel what am I wanting people to feel here and how can I be doing that with with 
the tools that I have. And then also with the actors, I've been working with this amazing coach who works with directors on um, preparing their scripts to work with actors. And it's and each actor might approach their job differently. And so it's understanding the best way uh, to empower the different team members you're working with to be bringing their best, but also in the direction that you want. Uh, and, and so I think for, for actors to be able to have time to consider the character and um, this is also sometimes the characters are going through a lot emotionally, especially in horror. And so to give them the time to process what it is that that character is feeling and, and it might be something that is reflected in their own life and that takes time to adjust to and some work for yourself so you're feeling, you know, mentally fit on the day. You know, creating an environment where everyone feels like we're supporting each other as a team in this, uh, in the creation of, of something that, you know, either tells a cool story or, you know, has an impact on people. I, I mean, when it comes to the way Hitchcock works with his actors, I definitely think there's a different way of, of, of approaching it. But I think it's, um, yeah, how can you get the actors to the place where they feel comfortable on the day bringing that emotional performance and then making sure, it, you know, the rest of us have all of our stuff figured out so that they can do their their work on the day in in a way that you know is consensual <laughs> and um it, it must have been um especially challenging because you were working with <clears throat> young actors for this film um it, it was their first film for most of them or for all of them oh yeah for all of them and so and it was uh, yeah, but it was for some of them I had been kind of working with a little bit longer and they had been around even the script development phase, things that they said or, or were referencing were directly came from them. So some of them it was a little bit maybe easier to kind of perform as their character, but it was really funny actually promoting the movie with Tassiana who plays Micah the lead and people would meet with her and they're like, wow, she's nothing like her character. And I'm like, I know she's acting, <laughs> but um, it, it was really, it was such a joy to work with the actors. They were, uh, it was for all of them, their first time. Frankie was eight years old. And then I think the next youngest was 11 and the rest were 14. So it was a young cast and they were all away from their hometown of Halloween. They were living in Peng for the summer and living in a school. So it was really fun and exciting, but it was also exhausting at times. And, but what I think was so great is that the girls had developed and Rory, I should say, had developed a real relationship. Uh, and so they were able to, just support each other throughout the process and we never had any crazy crazy fights or blowouts which is kind of amazing for for working with a bunch of teenagers all summer and I'm curious to know if any of the teens that acted in the film had seen or were familiar with Hitchcock did you ever have that discussion with them I'm told that that <laughs> people today are not so into Hitchcock but <laughs> I know no they uh, none of the kids had watched Hitchcock necessarily. Yeah, they they do like horror, some of them. Frankie in particular, the youngest one, she likes scary movies the most, which is kind of funny. But Chelsea is is someone she wouldn't who's who was the, the tallest one of the group and she she doesn't like scary movies. Uh, Alexis, she is I think she, has uh, Alexis and Knowledge Us. I could see them both making their own movies. They liked the being around sets and and are storytellers themselves. And Tassiana it le really liked the liked acting and is going to continue doing that. She's. I mean, these kids. It's so amazing. Well, now they're not so much kids. They're eighteen years old and going to university. And wow. 
Mm. So. <laughs> um, I, I <laughs> interesting that from uh, the beginning of this um, um, conversation, you mentioned uh, both uh, Psycho and The Birds as the um, films that uh, were important to you, because um, when Psycho is um, mentioned sometimes as the first slasher of a, of a sort, and I think that for uh, Slashback, this is an interesting mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but um, while watching your film, I was struck by the way you film uh, that bay near Peng that reminded me a lot of Bodega Bay in The Birds. I don't know if that was something conscious on your part, but you know that there are those trips that they take in the boat that are very reminiscent of what Melanie does uh, in The Birds. Um, so this is really something that struck me. And also, I mean, I, I think that The Birds is a very apocalyptic film. Yeah, I think so too. And I, yeah, I love The Birds and I've always been just drawn to the the themes and the characters. I also just, you know, this Tippi Hendren in that, car in that movie was just with, with her getting on the boat and driving across the bay I I've always just I thought that it, she she was such a cool character and I know she's kind of seen as a, is a little bit you know silly in the movie but um I've always thought that she was kind of great and then also just yeah the the kind of securing of the house and and preparing for this um this invading threat uh I think that 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 is something that I definitely was thinking of and the birds, Jaws, of course. And, and I still actually, I, I, I like this, the mystery of, you know, this kind of small coastal town dealing with this um, strange thing that's, that starts happening. Uh, that's something that I think is it was it's something familiar and then to kind of place it in this place that's also familiar to me uh but obviously maybe not familiar to lots of people was was fun and it's a group of people um as in your film it's not just one person it really is a community yeah that's impacted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely and and that was um that was also kind of fun to play around with too just in and then it was this the threat kind of at first it 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 starts with affecting this kind of outsider the police officer but then moves towards closer to home to to the father and um and to the fisherman of course um it was it was definitely an interesting uh, but also just just for myself and it, a process for uh, I had just been coming out of a bit of a not a bit of a, a big health scare and and this it this kind of invading threat and having to kind of figure out how to fight it was something that I was just also on a personal level just having come out of it was um, I think important for me to kind of process that and kind of have these girls succeed in, in kind of, uh, you know, getting rid of the, the invasion. And I love the way that you build on the slasher mythology in terms of normally a slasher film is really anthropocentric in that it's about humans dying. But here we also have animals that have been parasited so the entire land itself and all life forms have been you know um endangered by this this alien presence that's not been invited of course uh onto the land and the the young women are not just defending themselves but their entire community including all of the life forms that are there and i really really appreciated that thanks yeah when i was thinking about this movie i was thinking about these really amazing, resilient Inuit women. And I thought, you know, if if anyone was gonna be able to handle an invading threat, these <laughs> these gals, you know, would would it would be tough to take them on. Uh, so I was definitely inspired by by a lot of, of uh, amazing women up in the Arctic. And there is a real feeling of fighting for or just a, you know a recognition of the importance of of our relationship to the land and and 
having a having a meaningful and respectful relationship with the land mm -hmm. uh, that, and that it's uh, something that it, it is also has you should have a healthy fear of as well but the, but the, 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 the mood of the film is very positive and it, um, it's interesting to contrast it with um, Psycho which is a, a night slasher where, whereas yours is a day slasher isn't it <laughs> yeah by almost by necessity because in the summer the sun basically doesn't go out and go down in Nunavut. Um, and yeah, it was really important for me for this movie to feel really empowering um, just because it was especially made for kids. And also that are recognizing that there hasn't always been empowering representations of our communities on screen. And to have that represented was really, was really important to me and, and to have people feel really proud of, of being from, from the Arctic. I'm just thinking too about in one sense, how Psycho is a bit of a cautionary tale uh, in terms of the fact that the protagonist, you know, she's done something really uncharacteristic for her, which is to steal this money, <laughs> assume that she doesn't have any kind of criminal record. And then the result, as we know, <laughs> is what it is. Um, and I'm just wondering if in a very different way, if you've also thought about cautionary tale in terms of um, a cautionary tale in terms of invasion and then what these women defend and the way they take care of business or, if the cautionary tale has played an important role in your own writing. She shouldn't yeah, have, definitely. She shouldn't, Sorry, what was that? She shouldn't have stolen her um, friend's uh, cell phone. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I think that that is, um, I definitely love playing with the idea of the cautionary tale and that's something that is, quite common in horror and Hitchcock definitely does that. Uh, she, she steals the money and, and uh, then gets murdered almost immediately. And the, I was going to say, no, sorry for the spoiler, but I feel like, you know, if you haven't watched it yet. <laughs> and for me growing up, I did the, these, we have these scary stories that were told all the time. The, the Arctic is a very, very dangerous place to live. There are certain rules that are just important to follow. And of course, we don't always follow them. Like in the springtime, the ice breaks up and it's really fun for kids to jump in between the ice, the floating ice as it's kind of breaking up in the springtime. And they do it in shallow enough water that it's, um, you know, it's going to be fine. But the, we have these stories about Hadapidluit, these women who live underneath the ice and steal children. They just kind of wait for children to jump so that they can steal them and take them as their own. And they wear these amautis, the big hoods, so that they can carry the, the children in their backs. And, and so it was playing around with that idea of, of these cautionary tales. And also, but just, I think that even in the work that I'm I'm working on right now is one is a documentary and we're playing around with these ideas of the importance of learning lessons from you know mistakes. We also have, I think, within our communities, if we don't want to talk about something, we might create a cautionary tale around it as a as a way to, as an easier way to talk about the thing. But sometimes it's important to talk about, you know, these scary things in order for, in order to heal and it's, and not to be afraid all the time. I mean, but then it's also, it's, it, it's, it's fear is also kind of a warning of danger. So it's something that's important to be, to be listening to. But these are things that I think that um, are, are so fun to kind of play around with within within storytelling especially if if, if you know you have someone that has had it, that has uh kind of had the tension that comes with this uh the kind of the making of the mistake is also you know, very an important part i think adults are almost absent from the film i mean it's really told from the point of view of the of the children uh, what, what is it that made you choose to story from that perspective? 
Yeah, I think that that was just something that was that was very early on, uh, something that was fun to play around with, especially mostly because of partially my experience growing up and having adventures with my brother and and our friends. But when we got there in Tepang for the very first time, when the sun kind of rises up in the sky and then doesn't set for 24 hours, or actually doesn't set for 11 days, the kids, they just are, have basically free reign of this place. And it's, uh, the adults still have to go to work in the day and they kind of live their normal lives, but the kids, they're just out of school. And because this is the one time of year where the sun, it's just up all the time and it's beautiful and the kids can be out exploring that they're encouraged to do so. And so you just see these like gigantic packs of kids at three in the morning walking around playing and it's like a ghost town. And so to be able to kind of uh, showcase that that side of the community was was something that we wanted to explore. And um, is there anything you can tell us about the next film? Is there anything you would be able to share at this point? Is it going to be more genre defying um, narrative with a bit of horror or what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I would say it's uh, a comedy tragedy disguised as a horror. <laughs> it is more of an uh, an adult horror for sure that was a goal for, of mine to kind of do something a little more mature and it was written at a time of kind of confusion it, it, it happened in the middle of the pandemic and the summer of 2020 specifically when the world was just changing uh, you know the death of George Floyd changed the way we talk about race and and representation and the get out had come out and every and changed everything and Parasite had won Best Picture and so I found that a lot of people were re really interested in racialized storytellers talking about race but in a fun way <laughs> and I was struggling a little bit with the ethics of drawing from trauma for entertainment, uh, whether it was my own trauma or what felt so much worse was my community's trauma. Again, the cool thing about working in, in making movies and horror is that I got to take that anxiety that I was thinking and just have that be the focus. And so it really kind of is, is something that deals with with a bit of those issues and um, in a bit of a meta way. And where, where will the film take place? We're gonna film it in Toronto-ish. It's gonna be kind of, it's called In the Heart of the South. So it's not filmed in the Arctic because we basically call anywhere that's not the, the Arctic, the South. And I know that when you agreed to come on the podcast and you suggested to speak about Psycho, I'm wondering if you might give our listeners um, who might not have already seen Psycho, can you give them in your own words a reason why we should watch Psycho today? You know, we know about what's problematic about Hitchcock, but why should we still watch Hitchcock? Yeah, uh, I think that, um, I mean, and, you know, cons I think it's important to to, to recognize that, that Hitchcock is a controversial guy, but you know, there are these really amazingly strong performances by these women that uh, that drive the movie and and this, you know, love of these two sisters. And I think it's such a fun and influential horror movie on and and it's really one that I feel like the themes that are within it, I, I mean, I can watch it now as a 37 year old and my understanding of the themes are so different than what my understandings must have been when I was 15 and watching it for the first time. Yeah, I think that it's it's really kind of interesting to, you know, these, these um, dynamics and are, are, are so interesting to be considering and exploring and I, I feel just as relevant today. 
Thank you. And, and it's as you said earlier, too, that filmmaking is such a collective effort, too, that we don't, you know, it's really important to emphasize, as you said, those powerful performances from the actors, what we get from the musical composer, the editing, all of these elements that work together to make the film this cohesive unit. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about auteurs and that sort of thing. But my little brother who directs animated stuff is, uh, we kind of joke that people that identify as auteurs are probably overestimating their importance to the project, <laughs> which directors probably do anyway as a personality trait. <laughs> but it is, it really is such a team sport. And and the so it involves so many amazingly talented people coming together and bringing their ideas. I think for me, what um, I try and focus on in the in the process of making movies really is that collective effort. That it is so amazing that we're this group of people are coming together and making something from just an idea, and that. There was nothing that existed before, but we kind of came together and created something. I think that that process is so special that it is to me almost, you know, that is the thing. Hopefully then we feel proud enough that we can be, you know, sharing it. And, and I sometimes I'll watch a movie and I know that I had said that, you know, I'm, I watch movies differently, but I still will sometimes just turn on a movie I haven't seen before and then just be so delighted and just feel like oh wow I just like someone presented this little gift and I mean this team of people have presented this created this little this experience and it's and story and it's and so it's so kind of I, I do still believe in this kind of magic of of the story. Yeah. And this relates to what you were saying about the fact that uh, sometimes people are too harsh when they don't like a film and they forget uh, the huge amount of work and love that pe the, the people making the films put into them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's um, certainly with, with Slashback where we were trying to do something uh, that was a bit different and, and, you know, considering how we did it and how the community was involved, I think that it was, yeah, I mean, but also I should say that if, if I was to do it again, I would do it entirely differently. It's, it, but that's, I think also just for myself, I can, can only be super grateful for the, for the experience and the lessons and just try and get better, really. Is there a question we haven't asked that we should have asked? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, we really thank you for spending this hour with us. We really appreciated hearing more about your process and how it relates to your own cinephilia and the films that have been important to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to After Images. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow After Images podcast on social media.